Carnivorous plants captivate the imagination. Since their discovery, we've dreamt up all sorts of blood-sucking blossoms and man-eating shrubs. And we often think of plants as a little bit inanimate because they don't necessarily move on our time scale. So the fact that some of them do move and are even predatory is a horror ripe for fiction. Long before Little Shop of Horrors made Venus flytraps famous off Broadway, these fictional accounts of man-eating plants flourished in the literature, and we can trace their roots back to the late 19th century. This was a time of profound social and technological change, and the globe-trotting botanical explorers and intrepid amateurs brought tales of these unusual plants and flora back to Europe that ignited the imagination. In Sea and Land by J.W. Buell, a large tentacled and spiny plant squeezes the blood out of unfortunate travellers who encounter it. In Under the Puka Tree by Phil Robinson, an enticing plant with waxen flowers entraps a young boy. In 1905, H.G. Wells published The Flowering of the Strange Orchid, in which an orchid collector is nearly killed when he is attacked by one of his specimens. Man-eating plants are of course a myth. The stories of them were inspired by the blurring of facts and fiction when travellers came back from expeditions with stories to tell. But they've inspired writers and scientists alike. For a time, Charles Darwin was intensely dedicated to studying carnivorous plants. At one point, writing in a letter to his friend Charles Lyell, at this present moment, I care more about Drosera than the origin of all the species in the world. The intrigue and wonder of carnivorous plants, the green predators of the plant kingdom, is something that still inspires botanists and the general public to this day. But much of what we know about carnivorous plants is actually based on some crucial observations that were made in the 19th century by scientists. So let's explore some of these early discoveries and find out what makes these plants so captivating. My name is Chris Thurigood and I'm a botanist here at Oxford Botanic Garden. I've always been fascinated by plants such as these. These are carnivorous Nepenthes pitcher plants. I remember growing these as a child and drawing and painting them. And to visit the place where these plants hail from in North Borneo was such an incredible experience for me. To walk in the footsteps of some of the great botanical explorers. And these were the source of inspiration for many paintings and illustrations that I've done since. But there's one very special place that stands out in my mind, one very important mountain where so many of these plants grow in the north of Borneo, Mount Kinabalu. Mount Kinabalu is the highest mountain in most of Southeast Asia at 4,095 metres, and it is a botanical paradise. It's a world heritage site, it's a place of great conservation importance, and many intrepid tourists visit the mountain every day. But the mountain also has a very rich history of botanical exploration. So today we're going to explore some of that history and the biology of some of the fascinating plants that grow on this mountain. Carl Linnaeus was the father of modern taxonomy. He brought Nepenthes pitcher plants into the realm of science. He didn't know that the plants were carnivorous and believed that the pitchers collected rainwater. He gave the plants their romantic name Nepenthes in reference to a passage in Homer's Odyssey in which Helen threw the drug Nepenthe into wine to relieve the cares of her guests. Linnaeus said, if this is not Helen's Nepenthes, it certainly will, will be, be for all botanists. What botanist would not be filled with admiration if, after a long journey, he should find this wonderful plant? In this astonishment, past ills would be forgotten when beholding this admirable work of the Creator. Hugh Lowe made three expeditions to Mount Kinabalu. He left an empty wine bottle as a memento on the summit plateau on his first ascent, although he didn't reach the summit peaks. Lowe's efforts to introduce pitcher plants from Kinabalu to cultivation failed. However, his dried specimens excited the botanical world when they were described at the Linnaean Society in 1859. One plant he did successfully introduce was the hybrid Nepenthes hookeriana. One of the plants Lowe saw on his expeditions with Spencer St. John was later collected by Frederick Burbage, Nepenthes burbigii. Their description of finding this beautiful plant was as follows. Crossing the Hobang, a steep climb, led us to the western spur along which our path lay. Here, at about 4,000 feet, Mr. Lowe found a beautiful white and spotted pitcher plant, 
which he considered the prettiest of the 22 species of Nepenthes with which he was then acquainted. The pictures are white, and covered in the most beautiful manner with spots of an irregular form, of a rosy pink colour. Burbage, who collected the plant, also made sketches of the plants he saw on Mount Kinabalu and sent them to the botanist Joseph Hooker. The pitcher plant Lowe was most famous for discovering, however, was Nepenthes Lowei. He discovered this plant on his first ascent of Mount Kinabalu in 1851 and wrote in account of the climb. A little way further, we came upon a most extraordinary Nepenthes of, I believe, a hitherto unknown form. The mouth being oval and large, the neck exceedingly contracted so as to appear funnel-shaped and at right angles to the body of the pitcher, which was large, swollen out laterally, flattened above, and sustained in a horizontal position by a strong prolongation of the mid-rib of the plant, as in other species. It is a very strong growing kind, and absolutely covered with its interesting pitchers, each of which contains little less than a pint of water, and all of them were full to the brim, so admirably were they sustained by the long supporting petiole. The eminent Professor Corner, who led expeditions to Kinabalu much later in the 1900s, recorded a ringing gonging which we traced to tree shrews, scampering over the pitchers of Nepenthes Loei, and banging old, empty, and resonant pitchers together. Corner's observations of tree shrews scampering over the pitchers of Nepenthes Loei are really fascinating in light of what we now know about the biology of the plant. Tree shrews climb onto the pitches, feed on the nectar of the lid, and whilst they do so, they excrete into them, providing the plant with an instant dollop of fertiliser. It's actually very similar uh, to another plant that we're about to look at, and it's a fascinating example of mutualism between the animal and the plant. The animal benefits by feeding on nectar from the pitcher, the pitcher plant benefits by obtaining nutrients from the tree shrew's faeces. One of Lowe's most famous collections was of Nepenthes Raja. St John, on his expedition with Lowe, describes The pitchers rest on the ground in a circle, and the young plants have cups of the same form as those of the old ones. This morning, while the men were cooking their rice, as we sat before the tent enjoying our chocolate, observing one of our followers carrying water in a splendid specimen of Nepenthes Raja, we desired him to bring it to us and found that it held exactly four pint bottles. It was 19 inches in circumference. We afterwards saw others apparently much larger, and Mr. Lowe, while wandering in search of flowers, came upon one in which there was a drowned rat. And this spectacular plant is the king of pitcher plants, Nepenthes Raja. Imagine the amazement when the first botanical explorers, like Lowe, found this on Mount Kinabalu. That's the only place it grows, and I remember standing on a misty hillside among hundreds of these giant pitcher plants, and it's certainly an experience that I'll never forget, and has been the source of inspiration for many of my paintings and illustrations. The first botanical explorers actually encountered the bodies of dead rats in some of the pitchers, and it was long believed that this plant enticed, trapped and consumed rats. Biologists now know that tree shrews, a rodent a bit like a rat, climb onto the pitcher, feed on the nectar on the undersurface of the lid, and whilst perched on the pitcher, they excrete into it and provide the plant, which grows in very nutrient-poor conditions, with an instant source of fertiliser. It's such an incredible biological story. Each of these astonishing discoveries on Mount Kinabalu, made by Lowe, were announced in a paper read at the Linnaean Society of London in 1859 by Joseph Hooker. Joseph Hooker, following in the footsteps of his father, who was also a botanist, became the director of Kew in 1856. Hooker, a close friend of Darwin, was very interested in Nepenthes and was one of the first to speculate on the origins of the pitcher. He carried out similar experiments to Darwin's to show that Nepenthes pitcher plants were carnivorous. Joseph Hooker believed that Nepenthes Raja was the finest of all Nepenthes, and in 1859 he wrote... This wonderful plant is certainly one of the most striking vegetable productions hitherto discovered, and in this respect is worthy of taking place side by side with Rafflesia arnoldii. It hence bears the title of my friend Raja Brook, whose services in its native place 
may be commemorative among botanists. As a botanist, I'm inspired by the botanical exploration of the 19th century, and I undertook my own botanical expeditions to see some of these extraordinary plants. And the wonder in this kind of work, which long inspired botanical fiction, is a chance encounter with something extraordinary. Of course, we now know that carnivorous plants don't attack humans in the way that these fictional accounts might have once had us believe, but they are the predators of the plant kingdom and they've turned the tables on animals which eat plants. They've evolved a whole menacing myriad of leafy tricks, traps and snares. And so it's not that hard to see how the early writers and explorers ascribed them with traits associated with premeditation, devious, manipulative, scheming. Of course, we now know that these plants have evolved this arsenal of different traps to tap into nutrient sources where they might be scarce. But there's an awful lot that we don't know about carnivorous plants, and new species are still discovered every year by the plant hunters of today.